forget the day that I gave my life to Jesus Christ. It was a long time ago, many years ago. And it's not that I didn't believe in God before that. I did. In fact, there was a time as a youngster, as a youth, as a child, I wanted to grow up and be a priest. I had no understanding why I wanted to do that. I just wanted to do something because I believed in God. But did you know the Bible teaches us that just because you believe in the existence of God, that doesn't necessarily mean that you belong to God as a son or a daughter of God until the day you say, Jesus, come into my life. And that's what the born-again experience is really all about, according to the Gospel of John, the third chapter, and the third verse of Scripture. When one of the disciples said, Lord, what must I do to come into the kingdom of God? He said, you must be born again spiritually. But I can always remember the day, and I don't remember the hour. That's just one of those things. But I can remember when I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ, I, I didn't get religion. Because religion is not the same thing as Christianity. Christianity is not a religion. It's a way of life. It's a new way of life. It's a new way of living. Uh, salvation uh, and the gift of God. But although it happened many years ago, I remember and recall it as though it happened just yesterday. Uh, I was so excited to hear the preaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to where I just couldn't get enough of it. A few moments ago I said, Lord, we are addicted, or at least I know I am, to the ministry of the saints. That's what Paul the Apostle said, that we would be addicted to the ministry of the saints. I couldn't get enough of it. I wanted more and I wanted more, and that's the preaching of the gospel. But during the first few months of my new life in Christ, I had not yet developed an appreciation or an understanding for the teaching of God's Word, at least until I came to an understanding of how valuable the teaching of the ministry is for the preaching of the gospel. And I wrote this down, and I want you to grasp a hold of this as well. You cannot have a full understanding of the preaching of God's Word without the teaching of God's Word. Nor could you have an appreciation and reverence for the teaching of God's Word without the preaching of God's Word. We need the teaching and the preaching as much and more as we have breathing out and breathing in. As we have night and day, we need the teaching and the preaching. Teaching is the explanation of the gospel. Preaching is the proclamation of the gospel. And I want you to have a hunger for it just as I eventually developed a hunger for the preaching and the teaching of God's Word. But there's more to this. While I was excited as a young Christian to learn everything that I possibly could about the New Testament, you know, the Bible is broken down into the Old Testament and the New Testament, I wanted to know so much about Jesus, and rightly so. He saved me through His death, burial, and resurrection. I knew that it wasn't about a religion or religiosity. I knew that it was about a man, and yet He is God, and that's the Son of God. But I wanted to find out more about Jesus Christ and how He can operate in my life. But I wasn't interested for the first few months of my new life in Christ in the Old Testament. I wasn't interested in finding ab about the history of the Old Testament until I discovered this. I wrote this one down also. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I'll say that again. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. In other words, it foreshadows the things to come in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the things to come. But the New Testament has revealed everything that the Old Testament was necessary for you and I to understand. So our prayer is, Lord, I want so much the preaching as well as the teaching of your word. But we're talking today about Bible prophecy. We began this Bible teaching series on the signs of the times and of the end of the age by reading from Matthew chapter 24. Everybody say 24. There's a reason why I'm asking you to repeat that so that you can remember that. But we began by reading Matthew chapter 24 when the disciples asked Jesus Christ when he was going to come again. Now it's plain to see that the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, by this time in Matthew chapter 24, that they had already known that Jesus would have to die on the cross by the shedding of his blood and through his pain for the sins of whosoever would choose to receive him as Savior and Lord, for those who would repent. They knew this already. In fact, it's clear that they knew he would resurrect from the dead and ascend to be at the right hand of God the Father because he had already told them about these things. Now, the reason we know this is because Jesus told them four chapters earlier in the 20th chapter about his death, burial, resurrection, his ascension, and his soon coming again. Let's read something out of Matthew 24 and verse 17. The Bible says, now as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside and he said to them. 
I find it interesting that Jesus was always taking his disciples aside to tell them something or to teach them something or maybe to confront them about something, but he always took them aside. Why? Maybe it was so that they wouldn't be distracted by the crowd or family members or friends or whatever it is, but he took them aside. Not that he didn't speak to them in the midst of the crowds, but he often took them aside to like sometimes you take your child aside and you talk to them and you nurture them and you help them with some things and then you come back and you go on. The Bible says in verse 18, we are going up to Jerusalem, Jesus was saying uh, to his disciples. We're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man, referring to himself, will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death. He was referring to himself being condemned to death. Now remember, he's an innocent man, but he would die on the behalf of people like me, like you. But uh, verse 19 says, And will turn him, and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and, what's that word? Crucified. On the third day he will be raised to life. So again, I read that. We read that together because Jesus had already told them about his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, by the time Matthew chapter 24 rolls around, the disciples knew that Jesus would die on the cross. Uh, they knew that he would resurrect from the dead. Then... Then, by the questions that they would ask him in the beginning of Matthew chapter 24, they had to have known that Jesus would ascend to be at the right hand of God the Father and that he was coming back again. They had to have known that. What they did not know is when. And so they asked him. When the disciples of Christ asked him when he was going to return, he began to give them a number of signs. Some of them we've already covered. Jesus even gave them one answer in the form of a parable of which we've not covered as of yet. And that's what we're doing today. And this would be called the parable of the fig tree. Say that together with me. The parable of the fig tree. You've got to remember this because there's so much meaningfulness uh, in this as it regards Bible prophecy. Now be re before we read about the parable of the fig tree in Matthew chapter 24, keep your place there. There's something that I have to explain to you. Remember I told you that the teaching is the explanation of the gospel, whereas the preaching is the proclamation of the gospel. There's something that I've got to explain to you. In Bible prophecy, Israel is the fig tree. And I'm going to explain this. Those of you who are already Bible students, you know this. How many of you have already heard this? That Israel is the fig tree. Figuratively speaking, the fig tree, number one, is a symbol of Israel. And we're going to read a passage of scripture that shows us this. Number two, the fig tree is a reference to God's provision for Israel. Just like God provides for you and I. Now remember in the New Testament, Jesus said you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then he spoke about how he provides for us. So again, number two, the fig tree is a reference to God's provision for Israel. The third thing as it regards the fig tree is this. The fig tree signifies Israel's health both spiritually and physically. You don't have to turn to it, but here's what the Bible says in 1 Kings 4, 25. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel. Now remember, during the time of Solomon's existence, you know, uh, David's son, the kingdom was divided, but they were all still descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so there was Judah to the south and Israel to the north, but they were still the children of Israel. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety, each man under his own vine and fig tree. Now, Jesus, or in the Old Testament, doesn't mention the fig tree just to say it, that this is where they sat. There's a meaningfulness to this. Now, does this mean, here's the question, that Israel was blessed even during times when they rebelled against God? Because many of you already know there were times when they were... They were blessed out of obedience to God and then there were times when they brought a curse upon themselves out of rebellion and disobedience. So the question is, were they blessed during times of rebellion? The answer to that question is no. In fact, there were times when God told them what we sometimes have to tell our children when they misbehave. When they misbehave, and you've got different ways of disciplining them, right? But sometimes we will say, and I was going to give you something good. How many of you have ever done that as a parent? Or maybe you remember your mom and dad saying that. Oh, but you blew it. I was going to buy you something big. I was going to give you a present, but not anymore. You don't deserve it. So that's what we sometimes say, right? You don't deserve it. 
I'll never forget this. My precious mom, when I was a little boy, how do you remember these things? You know what I'm talking about. I remember when I was a little boy, if I was mischievous and misbehaving, she would say, you're not getting anything for Christmas. Now, that wasn't so bad. She would say, in fact, I'm just going to buy you a candy bar for Christmas. Now, to me, that's even worse than not getting anything because that's like a slap in the face. And I felt that as, at the time. She said, you're not getting anything. Yo, yeah, I'm going to give you a candy bar for Christmas. You know what I'm saying? And it's not that we couldn't afford something a little bit more, but she said, I was going to do something for you. Sister Grace tells us stories when her mom would say, and I was going to buy you this. Now, whether she, her mom meant it or not is a different thing. But there were also times when God actually meant it. I was wanting to bless you, but you blew it through your disobedience and rebellion. You know, it's true. Sometimes we forfeit our own blessings. Here's what I mean by this. And you know, when you've been around this thing long enough, you've seen things happen. Just when the blessing of God is right around the corner, sometimes we forfeit it and we say, you know what, I ain't going to wait any more longer. I'm out of here. I don't need this. I'm done with this. And we forfeit whatever blessing was just around the corner. You know what I'm talking about. How many of you believe that? Just when you are to receive the answer from God, we shut the door ourselves because we say, I am impatient and I don't want to wait any longer. I'm going to do my own thing. Here it is. Hosea chapter 9, verse 10. When I found Israel, now watch how this relates to the fig tree. God said, when I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your fathers, it was like seeing the early fruit of the fig tree. But when they came to Baal Peor, they consecrated themselves to the shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. That's kind of like God saying to you and I, the thing that you spend more time on rather than on me, that's what you become. They became like the shameful idol that they were worshiping. Whatever the idol was, there were many in the Old Testament. And by the way, an idol isn't just something that is handcrafted out of wood or metal or whatever it is. An idol and idolatry can be anything that you put in front of God. Hello? So he's saying, look, I found you and I gave you the blessings. You were like grapes in a desert. And then he says, but when they came to Baal Peor, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. And he had already spoken in that area of scripture about Israel being like a fig tree also. So what have we just covered? If it's all right with you, I'm going to go over the first three and then we're going to four and five. The fig tree is a symbol of Israel. The fig tree is a reference to God's provision for Israel. Number three, the fig tree signifies Israel's health, both spiritually and physically. Number four, and here it is, the fig tree is a sign of Israel's return to their homeland. Now we're going to be talking next week or the week thereafter more so about their return to their homeland before they became a nation once again. But that was a sign of the times and what the fig tree actually signifies and represents. Number five, the fig tree is a sign of Israel's rebirth as a nation. Let's read this story, the parable of the fig tree. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now remember, it's in this 24th chapter that speaks more about the signs of the times than any other one chapter in the, in the Bible. Matthew 24, 32. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Can I have your attention for a moment? In other words, when you see the branches of the fig tree begin to bloom once again, know that summer is right around the corner. Now, Jesus wasn't just giving his disciples a lesson in weather patterns or meteorology or anything like that. He didn't waste his time on anything that was insignificant. The branches blooming again means that the fig tree had seemingly died, but is now being reborn and re resurrected. That's what he was beginning to tell them. Verse 33. Even so, when you see all these things you know that it is near right at the door. Yeah, doesn't that remind you of something on the opposite from the early chapters of uh, Genesis when God said sin is crouching at your door? Well, something's going to be at your door, you know, figuratively speaking. Something's going to be out there, either the enemy or the blessing of God or something that he has for you. I mean, the door signifies an awful lot of stuff. Sometimes we open up the, bad, the door for bad things. 
Or sometimes you open up the door for the blessings of God. He talks about tithing so that I will open up the windows. One version of the Bible says the windows and the doors of heaven so that I will provide for you in ways that you never even thought I could provide for. So the doors are significant here. So he says, even so, when you see all these things that he'd already been speaking about, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth. All right, are you following along? This is the key word. This generation. Everybody say, we're going to say that a lot today, all right? Because it's necessary. This generation. Say it together with me. This generation. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. He said, this generation will not pass away. And we're asking, well, what generation? Which generation? The generation that would see all of these things that are listed right there in Matthew chapter 24 and all of the other wonderful prophetic chapters in the Bible. We are that generation. We are the people that are going to witness the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as a generation. Here's what it all boils down to. In the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament prophetic book, in chapter 66 and verse 8, the Bible says, Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such things? Can a country be born in a day? Well, now we say yes, and it has. Can a country be born in a day or a nation be brought forth in a moment? And it did. Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, the 16th of the 30 major signs of the times and of the end of the age has to do with the rebirth of Israel as a nation. I'll say it again. The 16th of the 30 major signs of the times has to do with Israel, the rebirth of Israel as a nation. Now, history records it that Israel became a nation on May 14th of 1948, of which no one can dispute they actually did. You and I know a little bit more than what's in the history books. But for everyone who has studied the Bible and believes every word of it from beginning to end, including the history of the Israelite nation and their existence, this particular event in 1948, in 1940, this is not the birth of the nation of Israel, but rather it is the rebirth of the nation of Israel, just as God said it would happen. They had been a nation in the Old Testament, but ceased to exist as a nation during the Babylonian captivity. The Bible says they were a people, but they were not recognized as a nation until much later on. But again, the Babylonian captivity came along. I'll explain that a little bit more. But this is why we're talking about the rebirth of Israel as a nation is one of the major signs of the times. Prior to 1948, even the theologians, the great scholars couldn't understand this, but now we know what it says. What is, this, what is so exciting about this is that it happened miraculously in our generation. According to Matthew 24 and verse 34, it happened miraculously. When it happened, and I'm going to be talking about this next week, nobody understood how it did, but it did. Uh, when I say our generation, it doesn't mean that we were all alive in the year of 1948, but that there are some people that you or I may know who were alive in 1948. Perhaps you have parents or grandparents who are around at that time. There may be somebody under the sound of this voice. You were around in 1948. This is our generation. The events of Israel becoming a nation once again in that year is not merely ancient history, but it is something that still can be remembered in the lives of so many people in our generation. In our generation. Why am I even going with this before we go any further? Because Jesus, I believe, would have you and I to know how much he loves you and how much he wants you to put him in the highest priority before anything and everyone else. <laughs> Serve him. Don't ever shove him aside. Don't ever shove his work aside or his word aside. Don't ever say, I would, but let him be the highest priority and you can't find a greater blessing than doing that. Am I right? Somebody ought to shout amen. The question is, what does this mean as it relates to Bible prophecy? I give you several things, five of them. You can write this down or you can ask me for an outline a little bit later on. I can give that to you. But number one, the rebirth of Israel as a nation on May 14th of 1948, it began a unique countdown to the rapture, of Je to the rapture, to the return of Jesus Christ. 
It began a unique countdown to the return of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm coming back again, and he's coming back again. Number two, the rebirth of Israel as a nation was and is one of the most important keys to understanding the signs that would precede the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you receiving anything from this? Number three, the rebirth of Israel as a nation was and is one of the most important keys for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Now, when we talk about the fulfillment, first of all, there's the proclamation or the declaration of a Bible prophecy when God said this is going to happen. And then the fulfillment is when it actually happens. Many of the things that he had prophesied about before or the prophets have prophesied before have already happened for the rapture to take place. There's nothing else. This was one of the last ones. There's nothing else that has to be fulfilled for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he can come back at any moment now. He could even come back before this service is over with. He could even come back right now. And uh, if he did, wouldn't it be sad that the majority of the people in any given church would be left behind? Wouldn't it be sad I, um, I really believe, according to Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, remember, I asked you to memorize that, or at least know where it's at. According to that verse of Scripture, it's going to happen like that. There's going to be a lot of people, a majority of people, not by race or ethnicity, but a lot of people by numbers who will be left behind compared to those who will be caught up. Only a few find it, so the Bible tells us this. All right, so again, number three, the rebirth of Israel as a nation was and is one of the most important keys for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. In fact, Israel is a sort of God's timepiece in God's timeline of events. If you see what's happening in Israel and you choose to understand it and you hunger after it, I want to learn more, then you'll see the timeline of events that take place. Knowing the history of Israel from its beginning to its future is the key to understanding all that God has for it. That's why it's fulfilling and meaningful and enriching for me. Because I've, I've longed for it. Now, I'm not boasting about it. I've just had a hunger for it like nothing else in life. And in order to have a clear understanding as much as possible of this extraordinary sign of the times, allow me to give you just a little bit of history of Israel's beginning and existence. May I do that? And I broke it down for you in simplified ways to understand it. Israel, number one. Israel begins as a nation with Abraham or Abram. His name was Abram before. In the year of 2000 B.C. or thereabouts. Again, Israel begins as a nation with Abraham in the year of 2000 B.C. It happened. This is accurate history. Let's look at this in Genesis chapter 12 beginning with verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. By the way, they're there right now. They weren't there, but they're there right now in that area that God showed Abram. He said in verse 2, I will make you into a... What, what are those words? Great. Say it again. Great. Help me again. Great. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So brothers and sisters in Christ, Abram, Abraham did exactly as God told him. He didn't question it. He didn't say why or why me. He just did what God told him to do. And he began with a journey that would take him about 1,500 miles. All right. Okay. This is what preachers do. Sometimes we can't even go one mile to the house of God. Ooh. Oh. Oh, wait. Oh, my gosh. I offended someone. Sometimes we can't even go across the street to a church revival service. Oh, my gosh, I offended someone. I am so sorry. No, I'm not because it's the truth. <laughs> but anyhow, his journey would take him some 1,500 miles through the desert and the valleys and all of these things. And his only motivation was his faith in God. No wonder he was called the father of faith. His only fuel for the journey was his faith in God. So again, Israel began as a nation with Abraham in the year of 2000 B.C. Now remember, this is B.C., therefore we begin with the bigger numbers as time goes by. Number two, Israel continues as a nation with Moses and the Exodus in about 1400 B.C. The word Exodus has to do with their escape from Egypt and Egyptian bondage. You know the story of this. So again, Israel continues as a nation with Moses and the Exodus in about 1400 B.C. Thirdly, Israel continues as a nation with King David in about 1000 B.C. 
the Bible regards David, other than Jesus Christ, as the greatest king who ever lived, that is, Israel ever had. Number four, Israel ceases as a nation with the Babylonian captivity in around 600 B.C. Now, that captivity took place in segments, in phases, so, but we're just going to say 600 B.C. for now. Now, during one of the times of rebellion against God and against the laws of God, Israel was warned by God through his appointed prophets, that if they didn't repent and if they didn't change their ways, he would have no alternative but to discipline them in ways that they would regret for a long, long time, for generations to come. God told them that. And they didn't listen. They rebelled. They had their own idols. They put God in the back burners. And therefore, it left God with no alternative. This doesn't mean he didn't love them, but he just wanted through, through discipline to, to show them his love. Well, one day it happened and the Israelites were overtaken by the wicked, vicious Babylonian empire. And for 70 years the Jewish people were held in captivity to another nation, a heathen nation, a pagan nation. And it was at this time that Israel lost her independence as a nation. Do you understand the history of Israel? They they ceased to be a nation recognized by the people of this world. They lost their independence as a nation. All right, now we understand why there had to be a rebirth. It's just like when Adam and Eve sinned, we all lost our independence, so to speak. We all lost our way, but Jesus said you must be born again spiritually. Hallelujah. So when uh, the Jewish people were taken captive by the the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonians, uh, including many of their leaders like Daniel and the three Hebrew men, Their cities, including their beloved city of Jerusalem and their temple, was destroyed. Even the temple. But just as a visual reminder, there's there's an artist's rendition of the city of Jerusalem, including the temple, uh, being uh, burned and destroyed. It actually happened. uh, They came in, the Babylonians, and they destroyed the city. They destroyed the temple of God. Now, even though the Jewish people were in rebellion against God, they loved the place of worship. They loved the temple. Now, at that time, there was a high priest that would stand in the gap for them. But they loved the temple just like you and I love worshiping God. We are the temple of God's Holy Spirit, right? They burned the house of God. Whoa. They burned. They disrespected the house of worship, the house of God. There are people that are trying to do that today in different parts of this land. And again, the destruction, and then they took the goods and all of that stuff. It was completely destroyed. It took them a while, but after the 70 years of captivity, the Israelites that were in captivity, they eventually humbled themselves. They saw that they were lost without God. They humbled themselves. They acknowledged their sins. They asked God to forgive them of their sins. And God saw the repentance and God made a way miraculously to return to their homeland for that period of time. Not so much as a nation, but as a people. So they went back to their homeland. Now, although Israel would... Are you with me? Are you getting into this? No, no, I'm getting into this. Although Israel would uh, exist as a people, they would not exist as a nation because from that time forward, they would be under the domain and the dominion of other world major empires. The Babylonian captivity was just the beginning. Then there was the Medo-Persian Empire, which overtook the Babylonian captivity. There was the Grecian Empire, and then there was the Roman Empire. But they were always, for hundreds of years, under the dominion of another empire. And most of them were wicked and vicious. What have we covered? Here's the first four. Israel begins as a nation with Abraham in the year of 2000 B.C. Israel continues as a nation with Moses in the Exodus in 1400 B.C. Uh, Israel continues as a nation with King David in 1000 B.C. Israel ceases as a nation with the Babylonian captivity in 600 B.C. Number five. Israel remained as a non-nation people during the days of the Roman Empire and the dispersion of the Jews in 70 A.D. The word dispersion is that they were scattered all over the world (laughs) until the beginning of the last century. Now, in 70 A.D., there was a major worldwide dispersion of the Jews beginning in 70 A.D., as I mentioned. The word diaspora, and I looked this up. You can look this up under Wikipedia, and it's interesting the way that they say this. Watch. It says, a scattered population whose origin lies in a separate geographic locale. Historically... The word diaspora was used to refer to the involuntary mass dispersion of a population from its indigenous territories, in particular, the dispersion of the Jews. 
You mentioned the word dispersion. The whole world knows exactly what this is talking about when it happened during the Babylonian captivity. All right, I'm going to try not to get too over anyone's head, especially myself, but God is giving us an understanding of this. How about a, a thank offering just for the word of God as alive as it is? It's alive! You know, the Bible tells us that the Word of God is quick and powerful. It's alive, in other words. It knows what we're thinking. So again, this was in 70 A.D., which means that Jesus, it would, and some things would happen in 70 A.D., which means that Jesus had already been crucified just a few day, uh, decades prior to the, the, the burning down of the city of Jerusalem during the time of the Roman Empire, the dispersion. Sometime before His death on the cross, follow along, I'll, I'll go slow. Sometime before his death on the cross. That, that just wouldn't be me, huh? I uh, saw some, somebody on TV. I don't know what it was. Man, the guy was talking so fast. I said, well, I Pastor Grace was there. Man, he talks fast. She said, you're, you're a good one to talk about talking fast. She said, you're a good one, right? Remember that? I don't know what it was. So it's really, you know, like those, uh, those guys, you know, in the auctions, uh, you know. You know, I don't know, but they're so fast. She thinks I'm fast, and I'm not. You know I'm not. I was fast when I was a kid, when I was a young preacher too. All right, so sometime before the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, this was one of the reasons why he wept when he was looking uh, at the city of Jerusalem from a distance. He sat on that hill, and he was looking at the city of Jerusalem as a people who would one day be without a shepherd, and he wept. In fact, if you see in that verse of Scripture, you will see that this was the lamentation of Jesus Christ when he looked at the city of Jerusalem. Now, he not only knew that Jerusalem and its temple would be destroyed by the Roman Empire, but he knew that the Jewish people, for the most part, would not acknowledge him as the Messiah sent from God when all of this would happen in 70 AD. Jesus knew this and he predicted this. There is why we have the beginning of Matthew chapter 24 when this is what he began talking about. Not one of these stones will be left one upon another. And then they asked him, well, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? All right. So as we read from Matthew chapter 23, verse, in fact, let's look at this, verse 37. Here's his lamenting over the city of Jerusalem. Matthew 23 and verse 37. Oh, see if you can feel this. See if you can feel what Jesus felt at that time. In fact, ask him, Lord, I want to feel what you were feeling so that I'll know. Matthew 23, 37, oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Kind of like a mom or a dad saying, oh, my baby, my baby. You know. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you were not willing. He was speaking that, that time, but of a time to come. Look, your house is left to you desolate. He was, what? He was looking at the, uh, the temple, Herod's temple at that time. And uh, verse 39, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, sisters, brothers, this is one of the major signs of the times, and it has happened. We're seeing a lot of things going on right now as it will intensify even after the rapture of the church during the great tribulation period. But this is one thing that has already been fulfilled. When Israel was reborn as a nation after 2,000 years of not being a, uh, a nation. So that was the end of Matthew chapter 23 just before the disciples would ask him that great, great question in the first part of Matthew chapter 24. When will all of this happen? And what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? Now why is all of this so important when it comes to the rebirth of Israel as a nation? as one of the major signs of the times. I'll tell you why. Because at this point on, Israel as represented by Jerusalem that Jesus was looking at would not become a nation like before, but for a, for a long period of time, they would be under the dominion of many other heathen paganistic nations and empires. He predicted it and it happened. Don't think that whatever God is saying about our lives today is not going to happen. It's going to happen. But here's something even more importantly. Ever since the Babylonian captivity of 600 B.C., the Jewish people had desired to become a nation once again. That was their number one desire. But not until about the turn of the last century did the Lord begin to put things in motion for them in order to restore their ancient homeland and establish them as a nation of their own once again. 
Next week, I'll have a chance to show you some of the video footage when overnight Israel is recognized as a nation. They would get a, a seat at the table of the councils of nations, and nobody ever thought that it would happen. They believed, and there was a, 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 the beginning of, of the people coming back to their homeland that was, event, that was for so long called Palestine. And that's the reason why there's so much turmoil going on in the Middle East right now. But they would come back. And I am not even here to say that the Jewish people were the smartest people who ever lived because it was not any man's wisdom that put this together. It was God himself. When he says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And that's the plan of God. So Jesus said, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. Just come to me and I will give you rest. I said this last week, you can't fix yourself first or get things right and then you'll start serving God. That's backwards. You got to let him change you. Then the change will be good and everlasting. So he's telling someone right now, why are you taking so long to come to me? What's taking you so long? What is it going to take for you to return to the one who loves you as evidenced by his death on the cross of Calvary. What's it going to take? Why are you waiting? You, you, tomorrow's not promised to you. My friend, God loves you more than you'll ever even understand what love is. You, you have a pretty good idea what it is. But he loves you more than you'll ever know. Rarely will, will someone die for a good person. But Jesus died for us while we were still sinners. Isn't that what the Bible says? You don't have to wait another day. All he wants you to do is to say, Lord, here I am. In fact, like many people have done before, many have said, Lord, if you're for real, then show me. I give you my life right now and watch the windows of heaven open just for you. Will you bow your heads? As I lead you in this very special prayer, this is our prayer together. We couldn't do this if we didn't have God's word to show us how to pray. In fact, the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples. And he taught them how to pray. He didn't teach them repetitious prayers. That's not what the Lord's prayer is. The Lord's prayer is a model for how we should pray, addressing the Father and worshiping him. He said, come to me. Give me your heart. Give me your life. Pray, not just for my mercy, but for my grace. If you would like, say this after me, and those of you watching online, say this after me, and this is your prayer right there where you are viewing this and mean it with all of your heart. He'll never turn you away, and that's his promise. Say it now, Father in heaven. Mm. Thank you for loving me and for never giving up on me. Thank you for sending Jesus to suffer, to shed his blood, and to die on the cross. To heal me of my sins, my rebellion, my selfish ways. And right now I'm saying, I am sorry, Lord. Jesus, you are the one who rose from the dead. And you're alive. And you're coming back soon for me. And I must be ready. Save me. Forgive me. Come into my life. And I receive your forgiveness. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior forever and ever. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You're saved. He said, whoever comes to me, I will in no ways cast them out. That's a promise from the Lord. Those of you who are watching online, we want you to give us a call. Area code 719-546-1522. And we'll uh, pray with you and we'll encourage you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, but Jesus will always be there. We may not be there one day, but Jesus will always be there. And if you don't have a Bible, those of you who are watching, and we can share it with you, um, we'll, 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 we'll give that to you as a gift from our heart to you, okay? 
If you live in the Pueblo area or if you're visiting in this area from out of town, we'd love for you to join us for a time of worship at Abundant Life Church, located at 1001 Constitution Road in the Belmont area of Pueblo. The time of our services are 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings and 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. We at Abundant Life Church believe you'll find a loving group of people here and an exciting atmosphere of fellowship, hope, and encouragement. We look forward to seeing you. an answer to your prayer and your heart will find a safe and peaceful refuge when answers aren't enough he is there when answers aren't enough